The F-14 Tomcat is probably one of the most famous aircraft ever built, partially due to a certain movie that I, I think most of y'all have seen, just called a hunch here. The Tomcats were introduced in the 70s, and had a crew of two, a pilot and a radar intercept officer. They're 62 feet 9 inches long, had a wingspan of 64 feet 1 and a half inches, Unless, of course, those wings were swept back, in which case that dropped to 38 feet 2 and a half inches. They had an empty weight of 43,735 pounds and a maximum takeoff weight of 74,350 pounds. At altitude, they could reach a speed of Mach 2.34. That's 1,544 miles per hour or 2,485 kilometers per hour. They had a range of 1,600 nautical miles. They could fly as high as 53,000 feet, 16,000 meters. Their armament consisted of a gun, a 20mm M61A1 Vulcan 6-barreled rotary cannon, as well as 10 hardpoints, 6 under the fuselage, 2 under nacelles, and 2 on the wing gloves, which could be equipped with a variety of rockets, missiles, and later on when they were upgraded for ground attack roles, bombs. And their introduction to service was not really a smooth ride, as you would call it. The Navy had to fight a little bit to be able to even get a plane like the Tomcat. The idea for something like the Tomcat actually dates back to the late 1950s. The United States Navy was looking for a long-range, high-endurance interceptor to defend its carrier battle groups against anti-ship missiles that were launched from jet bombers as well as submarines of the Soviet Union. It was the Cold War, after all. They were looking for a fleet air defense aircraft, with a powerful radar and longer range missiles than the F-4 Phantom II to intercept both enemy bombers and missiles at very, very long range. Studies into that concept actually led to what was called the Douglas F-6D Missileer, which is a really weird name. Also, it was cancelled in 1961 because, well, that plane could indeed fire those missiles. It was subsonic and it really couldn't defend itself once it had fired those. The Navy wanted something with much higher performance than that. So they opted to participate in what was known as the Tactical Fighter Experimental Program, or TFX, along with the US Air Force, a program that was pushed by Robert McNamara, who was the Secretary of Defense at the time. He favored a versatile aircraft that could actually be shared by both services, which would reduce procurement and development costs. And from a financial perspective, yeah, that does make sense, but the Air Force and the Navy have very different needs from their aircraft. McNamara had already pushed the Air Force to buy the F-4 Phantom II, which was actually developed for the Navy initially. He told them not to buy any more F-105 Thunder Chiefs or F-106 Delta Darts. The Air Force kind of got away with it, but as time went on, the Navy started really pushing back on this whole let's share with the Air Force thing. And it really didn't have much to do with any rivalry between them, it's just that they had different requirements. And it's hard to get a single type of plane to handle both sides of the equation here. The TFX, which would eventually become the F-111, did have pretty good speed, range, and payload, but it was designed primarily as a fighter bomber, as well as an indictor a type of attack aircraft or bomber that operates far behind enemy lines. So as a result, it lacked the maneuverability and overall performance the Navy was looking for. It really couldn't dogfight super well. They pushed back heavily against the TFX, as they could clearly see that because of the Air Force's need for a low-level attack aircraft, the plane would have to compromise performance as a fighter, which is what they were looking for. But at the time, their concerns were overridden, so the project went ahead. General Dynamics were the ones working on the F-111, and they actually didn't have much recent experience with naval fighters, so they started working with Grumman to provide assistance in that particular area. But even if the Navy was willing to accept the compromises, both weight and performance issues repeatedly plagued the poor F-111. And as time went on, Grumman on the side began studying improvements and alternatives to this particular plane. In 1966, the Navy actually awarded them a contract to begin studying advanced fighter designs, which Grumman would narrow down to what they called the 303. The name Tomcat would eventually be chosen, partially at least, to pay tribute to Admiral Thomas F. Connolly. 
who was involved in the program, and the nickname Tom's Cat had already been used to refer to it. Talk about Grumman also had a history with cats. They built the Wildcat, the Hellcat, the Tiger Cat, and the Bear Cat, and when they got the Jets, they made the Panther, Cougar, and Tiger. They just liked cats over there, is really what I'm trying to say. Experience during the Vietnam War was showing that the Phantom lacked the maneuverability needed to win consistently in a dogfight against more modern MiGs. The MiGs were agile, and the F-4s, well, I love F-4 Phantoms, but some people describe them as strapping two jet engines to a brick, and that's not too far off. They really couldn't turn as well as some of the MiGs could, and that was causing issues. So a new program, known as VFAX, was introduced to study new fighter aircraft that would either replace or supplant the Phantom in the fighter and ground attack roles, while the TFX worked on a long-range interception role. Grumman was still ironing out the 303 in the background, and did offer it to the Navy in 1967, which led to further studies. This is also about the time Connolly got involved. He was the Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Air Warfare, and he flew the developmental F-111A variant, and found that it actually struggled to go supersonic, and had very poor carrier landing characteristics, which would make it very bad for the Navy for obvious reasons. He was the one who testified before Congress about this, and this testimony would convince them to stop funding for the F-111B, which was supposed to be for the Navy, and allowed them to pursue an aircraft that was specifically tailored to their requirements, rather than compromise with the Air Force. The F-111 would still get built, however, and the Air Force would make use out of them, but they were never the blanket solution for all the services that had been originally envisioned. But with the Navy now freed up to actually, you know, buy something that will work for them, they ended VFAX in favor of a new design that would combine both roles that they were looking into. Now that they were free from TFX, they could actually work on a plane that was able to do both. In July of 1968, the Naval Air Systems Command issued a request for proposals for the Naval Fighter Experimental Program, or VFX. These acronyms are very confusing and very similar, I, I know, but just, just, just follow me. This is a new program, not to be confused with the others. It's not VFAX, nor is it TFX. This is VFX, no A, no T, yeah. This program was asking for a tandem two-seat twin-engined air-to-air fighter with a maximum speed of Mach 2.2. They were also looking for it to have a built-in 20mm M61 Vulcan cannon, as well as secondary capabilities for close air support. The air terror missiles it should be able to use would include the AIM-54 Phoenixes, or a combination of six AIM-7 Sparrows or AIM-9 Sidewinders. Bids were actually received from General Dynamics Grumman, Ling Temco Vought, McDonnell Douglas, and North American Rockwell, and four of those bids included variable geometry wings. McDonnell Douglas and Grumman were actually the ones that were selected as finalists in December of 1968, and Grumman would get the contract in January of 1969. Even early on, the F-14 showed significant potential, though even its design had its own compromises, mostly because of the weight. So in order to fit all the requirements, Grumman had managed to create the largest and heaviest U.S. fighter to fly from an aircraft carrier. It was lighter than the F-111B, but it was still pretty big. This is because they were required to carry the AWG-9 radar system, as well as the AIM-54 Phoenix missiles. The Navy seemed just happy enough to get a plane that might actually fit their requirements. They could get over it if it was a little bit big, as long as it worked. And the F-14's actual development went fairly smoothly, all things considered. In fact, the Navy was so excited about this, that they just straight up skipped the prototype phase and jumped directly to full-scale development. The reason for this is because they were afraid the project might be cancelled by a new presidential administration, and while that was a big risk, it did seem to pay off. And in their defense, the Air Force did a remarkably similar thing to get to their F-15 Eagle. So I guess lightning does strike twice. You really shouldn't skip the prototype phase, but it worked here. The F-14 Tomcat first flew on December 21st, 1970, just 22 months after Grumman was given the contract, which is like record time for a new fighter development. They reached their initial operational capacity in 1973. The key design features of the F-14, well, are twofold. 
For one thing, their engines are spaced fairly far apart, partially to give space for armament. The other is the more clear one, which is the variable geometry wings. Their wings can actually sweep between 20 degrees and 68 degrees while in flight, and can be automatically controlled by its Central Air Data Computer, or CADC, and it maintains a wing sweep at the optimum lift-to-drag ratio, as the Mach number varies. And pilots can manually override the system if they want to, depending on what kind of maneuver they're trying to pull off. That design enhanced the agility of the plane, and interestingly, the F-14 didn't have ailerons. Isn't that like a standard feature on pretty much every plane in the modern day? And yeah, it generally is, but not in the F-14's case, and that was really because of the way the wings worked. Ailerons would not be able to work effectively because of the variable geometry. So roll control was provided by wing-mounted spoilers at low speed, which were automatically disabled if the sweep angle exceeded 57 degrees, and at high speed it was controlled by the tailorons. It was a unique system, but it did work. Like with many planes, over time there were different versions of the F-14 as upgrades were added to them. The ones that had a service were the F-14A, A+, B, and D variants. In the 1990s, they were finally given air-to-ground capability, Though, honestly, the biggest change to them had to do with the engine. See, originally, their engines were Pratt & Whitney TF30-P-412As, which were rated at 20,900 pounds of static uninstalled thrust, which enabled them to maintain a speed of Mach 2.34, it was good. But the TF30s were not very reliable engines. John Lehman, who was Secretary of the Navy in the 80s, told US Congress that the TF30-F14 combination was, and I quote here, probably the worst engine airframe mismatch we have had in years. And he called the TF-30 terrible. 28% of all F-14 accidents at that point were actually attributed to the engine. The turbine blades had a habit of, well, failing, and they were extremely susceptible to compressor stalls, especially at high angles of attack, which had the potential to throw the F-14 into an unrecoverable flat spin. Oh, and at specific altitudes, Exhaust produced by missile launches could also cause an engine compressor to stall, which led to the development of a bleed system that temporarily blocked the frontal in-tank ramp and reduces engine power during a missile launch, but that sounds like more of a workaround than an actual fix, if you ask me. But later they replaced the engines entirely with General Electric F110-GE-400s. The F110 was so much better in pretty much every conceivable way. Not only were they more reliable, but they were actually more powerful, giving the F-14s even more thrust, and improving their climb rate by 61%, a highly impressive increase. They were so powerful that the F-14 no longer needed to take off with afterburners, whereas the TF-30 always needed that unless they had basically no load. But despite these growing pains, the F-14 was generally well-liked by the Navy, as well as pilots, and they got their first kills in U.S. Navy service in 1981, on August 19th, over the Gulf of Sidra. In that engagement, two F-14s were engaged by two Libyan Su-22 fitters. The F-14s had to evade a missile and return fire, shooting down both of the fitters. Although the highest scoring F-14 pilot isn't American at all, he's Iranian. His name is Jalil Zandi, and he's credited with shooting down 11 Iraqi aircraft during the Iran-Iraq War. And yes, Iran does operate the F-14, though these days they don't have many combat-ready aircraft due to a lack of spare parts. As when we gave them the F-14, they were our allies, but after their revolution they became staunchly anti-American, even though they've been using American planes and, you know, I'm not even going to get into politics right now. The point is, Iran's the only one using the F-14s anymore, because we stopped using them about 2006. But why? Cheney. Cheney's why we can't have nice things around here. Do you not want to go to the danger zone, dick? The danger zone, yeah! I've been in the danger zone east of the Pacific Ocean, west of London, England, south of Mars, and north of hell, yeah! What happened was... The F-14D was supposed to be the definitive version of the Tomcat, but not all fleet units actually received it. They only got the Bs. The reason for this is in 1989, the then Secretary of Defense, Dick Cheney, refused to approve the purchase of any more F-14Ds, and he stopped production after only 37 had been built. 
although they did manage to make 18 more by converting a few F-14As, which brought the grand total to 55 F-14Ds. There's also a planned upgrade to their computer software to allow them to use AIM-120 AM RAM missiles, but that was terminated to free up funding for Lantern integration. Upgrades did keep it competitive with other fighters, but Cheney stated that the F-14 was 1960s technology, and that it was a jobs program, and he was determined to replace it with a plane that was both more modern and not manufactured by Grumman. This decision affected 80,000 jobs under Grumman, their subcontractors, and support personnel. And Grumman tried to appease him. They proposed multiple different versions of what they called the Super Tomcat, which would have adapted the platform for a bunch of different roles, one of which even had thrust vectoring, which would have been pretty cool to see, but Cheney was dead set against them. Why are you the way that you are? Honestly, every time I try to do something fun or exciting, you make it not that way. I hate so much about the things that you choose to be. The Navy was basically forced to pursue the cheaper FA-18 Super Hornet instead. The cancellation of more F-14s, plus the cancellation of the A-6F intruder variant, basically killed Grumman. It was controversial from many points of view, and eventually resulted in Northrop Corporation stepping in and acquiring Grumman to form Northrop Grumman. The F-14s the Navy had did remain in service until September 22, 2006, when they were officially placed into retirement. Some were scrapped, and some were sent to museums all across America, but I'm still kind of bitter about the whole thing personally, and I think a lot of us are. Like, the F-14 was a perfectly serviceable aircraft and could have been upgraded. The Navy was even interested, but Cheney was like, no, no, we're not gonna do that today because I said so. And, and you know, I understand as Secretary of Defense, he has to make a lot of hard decisions, but it feels like in this case, he just kind of hated Grumman. Like, that's just how it comes off to me. Maybe that's just my opinion, maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. All I know is everyone misses the F-14, but they had a good run. And again, they are one of the most famous aircraft in history, at least partially thanks to Top Gun and the sequel, and they'll likely remain a fan favorite for years to come. And with that, special thank you, because to all my underwater train finders, some do 267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsune 131-232, and Zach A1, Arthur Roy, Tommy Rossini, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Brian, Jack Carson's Railroad Videos, Lord Off 444, Mark Holding, Murder Drones Doll, A Person 723, DM Tribal Typhoon, Alfonso Lapuche, Raw Hudson 2860, Isaac for 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Matthew Wolf, Mr. Sleepy, Matt Weaver, Tom Red Lion, Edish Productions 8104, Hannah Bird, Hendrick Motorsports Fan 5, Wheeljack 8401, Rescues Greyhounds, The Baxter, Caleb Crosswhite, Ohio Trucker 1, Joshua Long, Andrew Bowen, Prez Drenton, Bradley Bowden, Dr. Racer 78, Josh Johnson, Hayden DeGro, Travis Stolinski, and Caleb Rainwaters. Till next time, this is Darkness, and we dwell a fun farewell.